Members, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Executive Office. We will start with listed questions, and I call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Ms. Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. Mr. Speaker, we were advised by the head of the civil service that we could use prerogative powers conferred on us by Section 23.3 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 to make an order that would enable us to make such an appointment. He took advice from his civil service legal advisers before informing us. The appointment was then made under the provisions of that order. The prerogative was not used, therefore, to directly appoint the Executive Press Secretary. He was appointed under an enabling provision lawfully made using the prerogative power. Call the member for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the First Minister for her answer? Given that the now in post Executive Press Secretary is undertaking cross departmental engagement with the media, especially on behalf of health, can the First Minister give an indication of the financial savings which departments will realise as a result of this new appointment? Well, of course, we are looking at EIS, and indeed, there is a, a structural review ongoing after uh, the Director left uh, and retired. And, uh, the role of the Press Secretary really is to do just what she has outlined, to work right across uh, government so that we have a cohesive uh, approach to the media and that there's instead of the sometimes glib and trite understanding of what's going on up here that there's a more in-depth understanding uh, of the challenges that face the executive uh, and how we're intending to deal with those challenges so yes he was very much involved uh, with the launch of the Bengoa uh, report and indeed the action plan uh, from the Minister of Health he will be involved in many other uh, initiatives of, as well. Uh, in terms of cost savings, I'm sure there will be cost savings, but of course that was not uh, the main uh, reason why uh, this gentleman was appointed. He was appointed uh, to have that more in-depth understanding of what the executive was doing in terms of its policies uh, so that people in the general public could understand. So the role of the press secretary is very clear. It has been set out in uh, the many answers that we have given around his job title and his job specification, uh, and he will work to those specifications and job title. Call Mr. Richie McPhillips. I thank the First Minister for her answer so far. Last week's High Court decision was significant in it disallowed the use of the prerogative of power to rush through the triggering of Article 50. Considering such developments, what is the Executive Party's plan if there is a vote on triggering Article 50 in Westminster? Well, in terms of the court case in London last week, uh, it did say that uh, Article 50 had to uh, go back to Parliament, uh, but as the Prime Minister has made very clear, uh, Brexit will still continue because that is the expressed will of the British people taken in the referendum on June the 23rd. Uh, and whilst the mechanisms may change, uh, she is very clear uh, that Brexit means Brexit. And uh, as regards how we will engage. We are very focused on our engagement and indeed we will be in London, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I, on Wednesday of this week meeting with David Davies along with our colleagues from Scotland and Wales where we will have a joint ministerial council to deal uh, with those European matters and we are very much looking forward to that positive engagement. Call Ms Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the First Minister for her answers thus far? Can I ask the First Minister to confirm that no one has sought to legally challenge her use of the royal prerogative? And can she further confirm that um, the first post-1998 um, use of this power was by Unionists and the SDLP ministers? Well, no. Uh, no one has uh, taken me to court for the use of the royal prerogative thus far. Uh, I suppose there is always time. Um, and of course she is right that this is not the first time that the royal prerogative power has been used. This is the fourth time uh, it has been used since uh, devolution returned uh, to Northern Ireland. The first time it was used was by the then First Minister David Trimble, uh, Deputy First Minister Seamus Mallon, uh, and it, as I said, have been used uh, by ourselves uh, for the first time uh, since I became First Minister. Uh, when we appointed the press secretary. So there's no mystery around the use of this power. The power was given to us under the Northern Ireland Act, as I've already indicated, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it is there for all to see. Call Mr. Jim Allister. 
Thank you. Why was the opinion of the Attorney General not sought before the decision was taken to exercise the royal prerogative powers? Would he not have been a most appropriate person to get the benefit of his opinion from? Well, I suppose we could have asked the Attorney General for his uh, opinion on this matter. We, uh, at the time, thought that we would go to the Chief um, Head of the Civil Service and ask him uh, to find out whether we could use those powers. He obviously checked with his own legal advisers and came back with the answer that, yes, it was available to us to use. As I say, we could have easily have asked the Attorney General either. There's no mystery in any of it. Well, Mr Stephen Farry. Mr. Speaker, given that one of the implications of the High Court in London ruling on the, on the royal prerogative around Article 50 was that, part, uh, that the executive, doesn't, in, the, in the case of London, doesn't have the right to, to legislate where existing legislation already exists, uh, does the First Minister therefore have concerns over the legality of the decision that this, uh, in Northern Ireland to use the royal prerogative in relation to the Press Secretary? Therefore, uh, no, I don't have any uh, concerns at all. As I said, we took advice from the head of the civil service who took his own uh, legal advice. As I say, this use of the royal prerogative is actually under an enabling power that is set out in the Northern Ireland Act, section 23.3. So there is actually legislative cover if he wants to go down the line of the court case uh, in England. So I have no difficulty in saying that we have used that prerogative in the appropriate way. Call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number two, please. The Executive's Action Plan, which was published in July, sets out how we intend to take forward and implement all the recommendations in the three-person panel report, including arrangements for reporting progress. On good relations, we are committed to building on existing strategies and will be giving ongoing consideration to these. Together, building a united community includes the establishment of 10 shared education campuses and the creation of 10 new shared housing schemes, and we are making good progress on these. Five shared education campuses are being progressed at the Moy, Limavady, Ballycastle, Brookborough and Dunedin Moneynick. Following a third call for applications, we expect to announce the successful projects in May 2017. Under Delivering Social Change, we have a £25 million project to incentivise shared education partnerships between schools and to enhance opportunities for children and young people to learn together, regardless of their religious or cultural background. 314 schools are engaged in 134 partnerships, and a further call for applications has been made. The Shared Neighbourhoods programme is also progressing well. Two schemes at Ballinafoy Close at the Ravenhill Road and Mance Court in St Field have been completed. A further two schemes are near completion, and six others are under construction. The Executive will consider in due course how to build upon this significant <coughs> success. Well, Ms Armstrong, first supplementary. I would like to thank the First Minister very much for her um, answer. Can I ask um, what impact has the UK Government withholding its contribution to funding the action plan in this report had on delivering on this particular recommendation? Well, as I said, we are progressing well in terms of uh, the ed shared education piece. I am pleased to see the number of uh, projects that have been made available, including one in my, uh, very close to my heart in Brookborough, and it is good to see those progressing well. Uh, and indeed, uh, under Delivering Social Change, we have been able to give that £25 million to incentivise shared education um, between 314 schools, which I think she will agree is also uh, a very good march forward. And then, in terms of the shared housing, uh, that is moving along very well as well. So, as I, I think she can see, there has been good progress made in relation to the sharing front. Of course, there is always more that we would like to do, uh, but we will continue to push ahead on this agenda. Well, Mr. Philip Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Following the disclosure by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive that in the last year alone over 400 people have claimed homelessness, citing paramilitary activity, how does the First Minister think the executive strategy will deal with this behaviour, given the first draft has already been rejected by the government as falling short? Well, of course, his characterisation is wrong, and the uh, government in Westminster has made that very clear, uh, but I would expect him to characterise it in that fashion. Um, yes, I was rather uh, alarmed to hear those figures last week uh, when I made uh, inquiries about 
what the housing executive were doing in relation to this matter. Uh, I have been told that they have been able to, under fresh start uh, allocations, draw down uh, 498,000, not an insubstantial uh, amount of money, uh, to deal with three programmes, uh, one on community empowerment, one on reimagining uh, communities, uh, which will try and deal with some of those issues that led uh, to those people being rehoused, and also a programme on bonfire management, which always becomes uh, a very topical issue at a particular time of the year, uh, not just in this House but in councils uh, right across the place. So there, there is work ongoing, particularly with the housing executive in the lead, to deal with community tensions and to deal with community programmes. Uh, but of course, again, we all have to take leadership roles in relation to this matter, uh, and that's what we need to do in this assembly: to give leadership and say that those activities that are going on, sometimes at a very low level, are completely unacceptable, and try to move people away from those activities and into more progressive and positive matters. And that's where these programmes come into their own, I think, in and around re-imaging. Uh, and I've seen some of the very good work that has gone on in those projects in the past through the Department of Social Development, as it then was, but now uh, being put forward through the Fresh Start Agreement. Call Mr Alex Atwood. Given the uh, report to the uh, Assembly by the Minister of Finance that London did not release in your monies uh, to deal with this issue uh, because of the lack of a detailed action plan, and given that this week, a year ago, the DUP and Sinn Féin uh, were promoting and had a fanfare of promotion in respect to Fresh Start, do you today feel embarrassed? No, I don't feel embarrassed at all because I've just told you that £498,000 has been drawn down under the Fresh Start Agreement to help people in communities right across Northern Ireland under three programmes for the housing executive, and that's just one part of Fresh Start. So why would I be embarrassed about that? I'm not embarrassed about that at all. Uh, in fact, I think that's something that we should celebrate. Uh, and can I also say that the money he refers to, of course, is money that will be rolled forward uh, into next year sometimes. Uh, people have this thing that we've lost money because uh, a programme hasn't been pulled together. I would much rather the programme was the correct programme, a programme that really could deliver uh, for communities. And in that respect, we will be able to pull that together and take advantage of that money, which, as I say, has not been lost, but has simply been rolled forward so that we can deliver in a more uh, positive way for the communities involved. Call Mr Robin Swan. Question number three, Mr Speaker. We are taking a collaborative approach to developing the programme for government. There is regular engagement with executive colleagues, including the Minister of Finance, in relation to the draft programme for government agreed by the executive on 27 October 2016. Those engagements will continue as we put in place plans to realise the programme's outcome uh, of societal well-being. Clearly, there is a connection between work on the programme for government and work on the budget. And once we have greater clarity regarding our funding envelope after the Westminster Autumn Statement, we will carefully align the budget to the programme for government. Call a member for supplementary. Thank the First Minister for her answer. The First Minister referred to working with budget and programme for government. Can I ask, has she had any d discussions with the Finance Minister in regard to set aside and the financial implications for the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme? That's a very creative way to get the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme uh, into uh, First Minister's questions. Uh, but of course, we are engaging uh, on a, a weekly basis with the Finance Minister in relation to the budget. Uh, that will become a lot more clear uh, once we have had the autumn statement, which is at the end of this month, and then we will be able to align the budget with the programme for government and indeed any other demands on the budget as well. Call Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for her answers so far. Can the First Minister in indicate whether the Ulster Unionist Party made a substantial response to the programme for government, and if so, whether there were any ideas worth taking on board? Oh, well, yes, I can. Uh, this is the response to the programme for government from the Ulster Unionist Party. Uh, the first page is a commentary on the programme for government. Uh, the second page, most of it is the same. Uh, they have one, one item that they wanted to bring to the attention of uh, the executive. 
and I'll read it out, uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission. In the spirit of constructive opposition, we offer one important addition to the 14 outcomes listed on page 12 of the Programme for Government framework. Now, bear in mind they've had months to put together their response to the Programme for Government, and this is what we get. In recognition of the legacy of the Troubles, we suggest the outcome should include specific references to victims and survivors beyond the general comment, we care for others and help those in need, and they give us draft wording. That's it. That's it in terms of the programme for government. That's it in terms of what the oppositions or one of the oppositions have to say in relation to the programme for government. That's it. Well, Mr. Philip McGuigan. Uh, can I ask the First Minister how the decision to adopt an outcomes based approach has been received during consultation? Well, it has been received very well. Apart from that response from the Ulster Unionist Party, we've had uh, 810 con uh, consultees have come forward and have put forward their views. Uh, most of them are a little bit longer than that, it has to be said. And actually, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I were both at a, 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 a a conference that was organised recently in Belfast, mostly attended by local government and the third sector. And again, uh, they warmly welcomed the outcome-focused approach, um, the very collaborative way in which we are taking forward the programme for government. I think uh, that most people who uh, recognise the need to not just work across government, but to work outside of government if we're going to make a real impact uh, with what we want to do for Northern Ireland moving forward. So, yes, it has been received very well. Uh, the second iteration is now out for <coughs> consultation. I would encourage uh, everyone to again look at that, uh, bring forward their own ideas, and that consultation ends just before Christmas on the 23rd of, Feb uh, 23rd of February. 23rd of December. Call Ms. Claire Hanna. Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for answers so far. And I noticed one of your colleagues was asking uh, about the SDLP's responses. We did put in 50 uh, suggested legislative uh, initiatives that the uh, government could, could, could take. But I don't blame the Australians. They're not there to be a think tank for you, and the opposition will bring forward. Like the Ben Goa report, I didn't see any financial allocations. Can you outline um, what uh, financial provision will be made over and above uh, recurrent spending to address specific programme for government priorities? Well, I don't know whether the member was in the House at the time when I said we were waiting on the autumn statement coming forward at the end of November so that we could align the budget uh, with the programme for government. That, of course, is what we intend to do. Uh, and I do welcome the fact that the SCLP did make suggestions because that is what opposition is meant to be about. Uh, I, I note that she gives cover to the Ulster Unionist Party by saying uh, that uh, they're not there as a think tank. No, they're not. They're there as an opposition and they're meant to put forward an alternative. And they haven't put forward an alternative, so until they do, they should reflect on that. Call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, First Minister, are you not somewhat embarrassed by the way in which you uh, seem to have sneaked out the latest emanation of the programme for government on a Friday before a holiday? But much, but much more importantly, are you not, uh, is there not a paucity of targets within the document that has been uh, delivered? I understand uh, the point about finance, but surely, surely a programme for government must have targets in it. Well, I'm certainly not embarrassed about putting the document out. There was a, a press release that went out. I'm sorry if the member was off on his holidays and wasn't able to uh, read that. Um, uh, and I cannot, I cannot uh, answer for the media. I cannot answer for the media. If they're not interested in covering uh, the programme for government going out for a second iteration, that's a matter for them. It's not a matter for me. Call Mr Philip Logan. Question number four, please, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Northern Ireland Executive's three overseas bureaus in Beijing, Brussels, and Washington, D.C. play a pivotal part in our strategic international engagement. The primary role of developing government to government relations is hugely important in underpinning the work of Invest Northern Ireland, Tourism Ireland, Northern Ireland businesses, and our universities on the global stage. Our international offices are in regular contact with decision makers in government and influential international organisations in their respective regions. This has assisted the executive in realising key programme for government targets. Mr. Logan, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the First Minister for answer. Uh, in regard to the Washington DC branch, I'm sure the First Minister will agree the, the great work they do of promoting a positive image of Northern Ireland uh, to, to America. Uh, would, the, uh, would the First Minister give us assurance that, uh, regardless of the result of the presidential election, that the uh, Washington DC branch will, will continue to do their work? 
thank the member for supplementary. And uh, I know that he was recently out in uh, Washington on a U.S. consulate-led program and was able to see at first hand the work that goes on uh, by our colleagues uh, in Washington. And I must say, I'm always amazed at the amount of ground they're able to cover with a relatively uh, small staff. Um, they have hosted uh, five ministerial uh, visits in 1516, a total of 34 visits by over 200 people from uh, Northern Ireland society, including two assembly committees, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, policing board, the universities, a lot of the councils who send out delegations. They sponsor or part sponsor a lot of events. And essentially, they are our eyes and ears, not only in Washington, D.C., but also in New York and indeed in Canada as well. They spread themselves very thinly but very effectively, and I think they do a marvellous job. Well, Ms. Jennifer McCann. Can I ask the Minister, um, just given that she's talking about visiting and that, um, to give us an update on your proposed visit to China in um, December? Indeed, both the uh, Deputy First Minister and I intend to go to China at the beginning of uh, December. Uh, we hope to uh, open officially, although it's been open for a while now, the Beijing office, which is our Northern Ireland Executive Office in China. Uh, we hope to also go to Shanghai and indeed to go to Shenyang as well in the northeastern province. Uh, and whilst we're there, we hope to sign a memorandum of understanding in relation to even deeper ties with Shenyang, because Shenyang is a, a, a sister city of Belfast. Uh, and they do a lot of uh, good work, and I do understand as well that the Northern Ireland Assembly Business Trust has just returned from China, and that that was a very successful visit as well. So we'll keep on. I know China is a huge market. Uh, it is a very long way away, but we believe, in conjunction with uh, the very effective Consul General here in Belfast, that there's a lot of very good business to be done. Call Mr. Steve Aiken. May I thank the First Minister for her answers so far. Uh, can I ask her what assessments have been made of how other non-EU countries engage with Brussels and the EU institutions, and what lessons is she drawing for, the, for our Brussels Bureau post-March 2019? Well, of course, the Brussels office, uh, just like our Washington and Beijing office, is really uh, our eyes and ears uh, in Brussels, and they are providing a very good job at the moment, bringing back uh, intelligence and information as to what is happening. Of course, uh, with the vote on the 23rd of June, there's a lot happening in Brussels. That's the understatement of the year. Uh, and so it is important that we get that information back to us. Uh, obviously, post-Brexit, uh, we will have to look at uh, the relationship moving forward as to whether uh, we need to have the Brussels office, but that's something that will come uh, after uh, the Brexit negotiations have finished and we have exited Europe. Well, Mr. Patsy McGlone. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, could the Minister advise what guidance has been provided to officials overseas in those bureaus around the issue of Brexit so that, if questioned, they have a consistent and clear response to those people so questioning? Well, of course, their position uh, is the position of the Northern Ireland Executive, that we will do uh, what is best for the people of Northern Ireland in these negotiations, uh, that we will move forward uh, and try to get the maximum amount of market access. Uh, and that, of course, is still our position uh, as regards negotiations and a message we will taking, be taking to David Davis uh, on Wednesday when we have our JMC <coughs> meetings as well. And it's one uh, of uh, looking for new opportunities in the post-Brexit world as well. And we have asked our uh, officials in the offices to make sure that they are alert to all of that because a lot of our companies are looking uh, beyond uh, Europe for opportunities. And I have to say I was delighted to see Brenton Mooney of Kanos as part of the Prime Minister's uh, trade delegation to India. Uh, he, of course, is an award-winning uh, member of the business community here, and we wish him well and hope that he is able to access more business opportunities for Kanos, which we're very proud of, a Belfast-born company doing global business. Call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Could I request a question number five, please? Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Ross to answer this question. Thank you. Just four days ago, the fifth group of refugees arrived here through the scheme. 
Uh, each new arrival will receive the same care and support as previous groups to integrate and start their lives anew. We are very proud of the part that we have played in the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme. With our partners from the NGO sector, we have shown that we can make the scheme work here successfully. And people here have been very welcoming to those families in their time of need. We will continue to welcome refugees on a phased basis over the coming months. Mr. McCartney, for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answer? And can I add my sort of gratitude, particularly from the people in Derry, for the good work carried out by many individuals and organisations in welcoming refugees? Uh, perhaps could the Minister give us an update as to how the, the complex needs of many refugees is being addressed on an ongoing basis? Um, thank the, uh, the member for his uh, supplementary question. We are making sure that through the scheme that we are uh, making sure that they are welcome in the local communities, working with local communities as well to address their, their many complex needs. Um, over the, the, the course of the, uh, the Vulnerable Persons uh, Relocation Scheme, we have been able to welcome just short of 300 uh, separate individuals. They all have very different needs, and what we have been trying to do is support them through the various offices within the executive office and wider government to make sure that any specific needs that they have are dealt with, uh, and making sure that any local issues that they have can be resolved at local level as well. Ms Paula Bradshaw. Thank you very much for your answers to date. Um, Following on from that question around the NGOs and, and the very sad news last week that NISEM are going to have to close their doors, how are you going to ensure that the NGOs have got sustained funding sorry, um, to give them support? Because I think that the problems won't just be dealt with very quickly. Um, well, I thank the member for that, not least to give me the opportunity to thank pa Patrick Yu for his contribution over, over many years as the chairperson of, of NISEM. I think it's important just to, to put on the record the fact that NISEM um, have received a considerable amount of money since the Minority Ethnic Development Fund uh, was uh, conceived in, in 2001. Uh, in 2015-16 alone, the group received £90,000. Uh, As members will be aware, the, the Minority Ethnic Development Fund has become an increasingly competitive process. In 2016-17, there were 99 applications, of which 32 were successful for a fund worth just over, over £1 million. NISEM made two applications, were advised that they had been unsuccessful and were given feedback um, with, uh, for those applications. I would point out to the member that uh, although uh, NISEM have decided that they, they no longer are, are capable of, of, of continuing on as an entity, we have seen many new groups uh, emerge during that time, and those groups are, are providing support to their members and are reflecting the needs of their members, not least in lo lobbying government and being a critical friend of government. So actually I see uh, more uh, organisations being able to access funding than has been the case before, and I'm confident that, that those organisations, not least through the racial equality subgroup, will make sure that their voice is heard and that they can work alongside government to address the needs of the people that they represent. Well, Mr. Richie McGrath Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the First Minister for an update of the provision of financial redress schemes for victims of historical institutional abuse. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Ross to answer this question. And the Chair of the Historical uh, Institutional Abuse Inquiry, Sir Anthony Hart, is due to deliver his report and recommendations to the Executive in January 2017. Late last year, the inquiry took the unprecedented step of gathering additional evidence through a targeted consultation with victims and survivors on financial compensation and other forms of redress. The outcome of that consultation exercise will undoubtedly inform its recommendations. We must wait and see what Sir Anthony recommends, so it will be therefore inappropriate to preempt the inquiry's findings or any future executive decision by speculating now on how or about redress or potential models of redress that the executive may agree upon. We have time for a quick supplementary and a quick response from the Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, obviously, we look forward to the report very soon. Uh, First Deputy First Minister will be aware that Margaret McGuckin's comments where she said financial redress scheme would cost in the region of 20 to 30 million. Can the First Minister outline how confident she is of securing this funding and whether it will be in the next financial year or whether it will be ring fenced or subject to budgetary constraint? Well, again, I don't want to either preempt what the report will say in January, nor do I want to preempt what the executive will agree to in terms of response to that report. What I would point out to the member is that a considerable amount of funding is available at present, and there's the executive office is providing support services to victims and survivors of historical and uh, institutional abuse at present. Since January 2012, for example, we've been able to uh, provide crisis counselling through Lifeline, that's face-to-face uh, -face by phone or at the offices in, in Belfast or Londonderry. 
Since October 2012, we've been able to provide a drop-in centre for survivors northwest in Londonderry. Um, since August 13, through Contact NI, we've been providing support services to victims and survivors as well. Uh, and of course, there is a, a small grant scheme that has allowed us to fund four victims and survivors groups uh, since 1617, uh, in, in namely uh, Sabia, Survivors Northwest, Rosetta Trust, and Birth Mothers and their Children for Justice NI. So, um, without wanting to preempt the, the, the result, uh, the, the report in, in January, I don't want to make any comment, but I would just put on record the amount of support uh, that we're giving to victims and survivors at present. Members, that ends the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Was the First Minister uh, surprised at the collapse of the proposed support package for United Airlines Belfast to Newark route? Of course, um, I thank the member for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak about this because this was uh, something that we were essentially forced into back at the end of the summer when United indicated that they were going to leave Northern Ireland unless. Uh, there was some intervention from government and, of course, the economy minister came uh, to the executive. He had a package proposed, but he, you know, he had to do it very quickly, and uh, I think it was worth doing. Um, I think it was the right thing to do at the time, uh, but unfortunately, the European Union did not agree with us. Um, they have decided uh, that we cannot proceed with what they call a state aid, uh, and because of that, United quickly took the decision, paid back any money that they had already received, uh, and they are now going to be leaving uh, Belfast International Airport, uh, I think, at the beginning of January, if my memory serves me right. So I regret that. I regret that deeply because uh, it was a very important link for us, a direct link to North America, and not just North America, but because New York is one of those hub destinations, it was really our entry into the whole of uh, North America. Uh, and I think it is deeply regrettable that it has happened. Mr Nesbitt, for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the First Minister. I'm sure she'll recall Sir Reg Empey, as Deputy Minister, was able to, to fund routes by putting the money into the marketing rather than directly into to the flights. Um, and she may care to comment on that. But my question is, was she satisfied the executive could have monitored how the money was used to ensure United did not turn it into straight profit? Well, yes, we spent some time going through this with United. Of course, it would have taken some feet to have spent £9 million on marketing, I have to say, um, which is why uh, we set up the programme and the economy minister put forward uh, the programme that he did. It was the right thing to do. Uh, of course, if we hadn't been in the European Union, we would have been able to do it, and that's the, that's the fundamental nub. Uh, of, of all of this. I think if I, were, if I was to look for a very practical expression of state aid bureaucracy, here it is. Yeah. Call Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could the First Minister tell us what engagement she or her department have had with Her Majesty's Government regarding compensation for victims of Libyan sponsored terrorism? Well, I've had uh, a range of interventions through my Westminster colleagues. Uh, indeed, uh, the, my deputy leader, Nigel Dodds, has been very heavily uh, involved in this Libya compensation issue. I regret uh, deeply that the government has taken a particular view on this matter, and I think they should reflect on that, reflect on the work that the Select Committee has been engaged on, and think again about this Libya compensation issue. Mr. Butler, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the, the First Minister for her answer. The First Minister will be aware that Lord Empey has introduced a cross-party bill that would see Libyan frozen assets in the UK used to pay compensation to its victims. Can she confirm the executive support for this legislative attempt to finally provide some level of justice to victims of Gaddafi-sponsored terror? Well, uh, although it doesn't sound like it today, I understood that uh, uh, Lord Empey was in another place and not uh, in the Assembly. Uh, we've had a lot of mention of him from the Ulster Unionist Party. Uh, but of course, certainly, I will support any attempts to try and uh, make sure that those who have suffered at the hands of Gaddafi's state-sponsored terrorism will be able to benefit from any compensation. I call Mr. Alex Maskey. Could the Minister outline how the executive might be able to support the implementation of the Bangor report? Well, I think 
think uh, the uh, very important issue of the Bengoa report is the fact that this is something that is uh, not just something for the Department of Health. We believe it is a matter for the entire executive to take forward because we're very much aware that if we don't try and manage the health service, then there will be a breakdown of the health service within the next 10 years. And that's what uh, I think Professor Bengoa referred to as the burning platform. Uh, and uh, the health service would require most of our block grant unless we intervene and do something. But apart from that, we need to be able to deliver a sustainable, better service uh, to our patients as well. Uh, and as an executive, we believe uh, that the way to do that is to follow through on the Bengoa report. It will take some time. It will take two mandates of this place. And in fact, this is the first time, Mr. Speaker, uh, that we as an executive, or indeed any executives before us, as I understand it, have taken this approach over two mandates. We believe it's that important to set the trajectory, to set where we're going over the next 10 years. Uh, and it's something that I wholeheartedly support. Mr. Maskey for a supplementary. Can I thank the First Minister for that fairly comprehensive report? And can I ask the First Minister that notwithstanding the very complex nature of all of this and the very significant challenges in the time ahead, uh, is the First Minister confident that this report and the conclusions of the report can actually be fully implemented in due course? Uh, well, I am, because uh, as I understand that the clinicians are absolutely <coughs> ready for change. They want to see change happening. Uh, it is they who are coming to us in our constituency offices and, and saying that change needs to occur. Uh, and it fits in very well, I have to say, with the way in which we are progressing with our programme for government as well. It's about outcomes. What outcomes do we want to see uh, for the health service over the next uh, 10 years and indeed beyond? Because when we get to the end of the 10 years, we hope that we will have a health service that is more efficient and, importantly, more effective uh, for the citizens that live here. So we're very much signed up uh, for the Mangoa report. Uh, we're signed up for the implementation plan, and I hope that the whole House will get behind uh, what is a very critical infrastructure for us moving forward. Call Mr. Danny Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister for her response to the recent Asher's Bakery Court judgment? Well, of course, uh, I was disappointed um, that uh, we didn't get a different result, but we have to. Uh, abide by the court judgment. I think one of the most interesting parts of the court judgment is actually uh, the way in which the court uh, commented on the role of the Equality Commission uh, in uh, the whole case. Uh, I understand that the costs to date which the Equality Commission have ran up are well in excess of £100,000. Um, and I have to ask the question, uh, where is the balance in terms of dealing with the faith communities here in Northern Ireland? And it's something I will be asking the Equality Commission to directly comment on uh, and to give me some feedback on. Mr. Kennedy, for supplementary. Uh, well, I thank the First Minister for her, her answer, particularly uh, uh, in respect of, of that issue, because uh, does the First Minister share my personal view, which was highlighted in uh, the court judgment? that the Northern Ireland uh, Equality Commission, and I quote, have created the impression that they're not interested in assisting the faith community where issues of this sort arise, end of quote. What action does the First Minister intend to take to address it? Well, I, I think, I, and I do agree with them, and I think it's very telling um, that three very senior uh, court judges would make those comments and make that commentary. Indeed, I think they go on to say uh, they had only seen evidence of one letter uh, in, in which um, the Equality Commission had been involved. So uh, I think it's incumbent upon the Equality Commission uh, to indicate to the executive how they intend to remedy what has been pointed out to them by the court uh, and what, uh, what affirmative action they intend to take uh, in terms of the faith communities, because there is certainly a chill factor there uh, in terms of the faith communities, and that's something uh, that is communicated to me on a weekly basis, and it's something that they have to, they have to take notice of. Call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, First Minister, given the major gap that has now appeared in both the policy and advocacy role uh, in respect of ethnic minorities in Northern Ireland uh, due to the lack of funding for NICEM, 
What is your department going to do to ensure that that policy and advocacy role can be fulfilled? And indeed, is there any recovery programme which you have for NICEM? Well, I'm going to ask uh, the junior minister to answer this question. I did touch on this uh, earlier on. I mean, the, the point is that NICEM applied for funding like everybody else and weren't successful. They were given feedback and they, they made an appeal uh, for that decision. That decision, the original decision w was upheld. I would point out that since NICEM first came into existence, there have been a plethora of new organisations that have emerged, and they're representing different ethnic groups across Northern Ireland. We're a much more diverse place than we ever were before. So I don't think that there's going to be a gap in that sense. I actually think that gap has been filled by other organisations who are participating with government in terms of the racial equality subgroup. They're making sure that their voices are heard and representing the views. So whilst I think it's disappointing for NICEM, and I pay tribute to Patrick and do so again, I think that there is sufficient uh, other new groups have emerged to make sure that, that nobody is left behind and that the voice of ethnic minority groups in Northern Ireland is heard at the highest level. So Dixon for a supplementary. Thank you, um, First Minister, for that response. But, but given that response, and given that there are, and the, 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 the answer is correct in terms of the, the number of new groups that have emerged, but I think the clue is in the title of NICEM. It is the Northern Ireland Council of e Ethnic Minorities. It is the umbrella organisation for all those organisations that you refer to, and therefore it is important that we retain that, uh, that, that umbrella role is, re is retained in Northern Ireland to represent all those new emerging voices. I think if you talk to some of the other organisations that have emerged, sometimes they perhaps see NICEM's role as not so much an umbrella, but actually increasingly saw them in competition with different groups, which wasn't what it was initially set out to be. Look, I am confident that um, through the racial equality subgroup, making sure that they work along with the, the racial equality strategy and implementing that, that all of those organisations, all the different uh, communities will be represented, will be listened to. And whilst again I acknowledge that the role that NICEM have played over many, many years in Northern Ireland, sometimes as a lone voice at, at times, that's no longer the context in which we're operating today. And I think that we have a number of new organisations who are, are going to make sure that that work continues uh, as we move forward. Mr Edwin Poots is not in his place. I call Miss Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, no doubt the First Minister will be aware of the current challenges facing survivors of the thalidomide scandal. Many of these individuals are living with unique complex needs and significant financial strain. Can the First Minister advise what discussions her department has had to engage with the appropriate bodies to obtain pecuniary compensation for survivors? Well, I thank the member for her very timely question because directly after this question time I'm meeting um, with some of the victims of the uh, thalidomide scandal and uh, I very much look forward to getting an update from them in relation to uh, their Germany case. Uh, I understand that they have uh, made representations to the European Union and indeed uh, with my colleague Diane Dodds uh, were able to get some traction in the European Union in relation to their cases. So as I say, I'm very much looking forward to the update that I'll receive from them uh, in a couple of minutes and, and see what I can do to assist them and to help them uh, against that particular government. Call Ms. Armstrong for a supplementary. I thank the First Minister for her answer, and as she's mentioned, the German government is facing increasing pressure from the EU and could be forced to recognise the responsibility it has to help the survivors. Um, and as you recognise, you'll be hearing an update. But um, as this issue has been going on for a number of years, will the First Minister be able to give any assurances that, regardless of the decision, she will do what she can to ensure that thalidomide, thalidomide victims in Northern Ireland are sufficiently compensated? And of course, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear from them uh, what their current position is. I, I uh, read uh, from um, the BBC website uh, from uh, Mrs. Fenton how, it, how the thalidomide um, crisis has impacted her in a very personal way, what it means for her today. Uh, I want to hear from her how she is coping in terms of her everyday living. Uh, and certainly they will find me someone that will want to be of assistance and want to be of help, whether that's in relation uh, to the German government or indeed whether it's in relation to the very specific needs that they may have uh, here in Northern Ireland. I call Mr Atwood and inform him that we may not get a supplementary. Um, could I ask the Minister's view on the publication of an anti-poverty strategy? Well, as the member knows, uh, we believe that the anti-poverty strategy was covered in other documents. The court took a different view. Uh, we will continue to work with, uh, with and across departments because, of course, that's what 
uh, the new programme for government is all about, making sure that we address all of the issues, not just in one department, but right across government, and it's no different for the anti-poverty strategy. Time is up. Uh, 